Always happy to be here. Oh, why don't we do the disclaimer first? Uh, I do have a financial interest uh, somewhere in something that's in here, in a product in my talk or with a company offering grant monies for this continuing dental and medical education program. But I won't talk about uh, any of my products, so maybe I don't actually have an interest in this. Uh, but I always like talking to IOMT. I like coming here and uh, I like being able to measure every measure everybody and sort of get a feel for what's happening in the people on the front line. Uh, I'm going to talk about the glutathione system. We've heard a lot about glutathione yesterday in the scientific program. Uh, Dr. Ashner and Dr. Good child. Uh, talked a lot about how mercury interferes with glutathione. Uh, they didn't talk as much uh, when Dr. Oshner talked. He talked about something called NRF2, which is a big master switch for turning up all the genes that handle chemo protection. Now, he talked about it in the framework of oxidative stress oxidative stress control, free radical quenching and such, but I'm going to show it to you in the context of being able to export mercury out of the system. And you do have a natural system for moving mercury out, and it's part of this larger system uh, that includes uh, glutathione and its enzymes and transporters and a number of other enzymes and we'll talk about them and one of the interesting things for years people talked about antioxidants and how cool antioxidants are and then we saw some failures with antioxidants using too much vitamin A or vitamin E causing more problems than good and then you know in the human way to swing from one side to the other we went into pro -oxidants. Accidents. And so ozone was the, was the thing. And uh, I'm going to talk about how the glutathione system responds to both of these. But in terms of responding to antioxidants, a lot of the compounds that we use we think are antioxidants. So lipoic acid, somebody would say, oh, it's a great antioxidant, right? Green tea extract, pomegranate extract, these are great antioxidants. They're not. Uh, in fact, they generate free radicals inside your cells, which are pro-oxidants, and that's responsible for their effect, and their effect is to turn up your own antioxidant system. And so we'll look at the different compounds that we can use to upregulate the glutathione system, but first we're going to go through what the glutathione system is. And first, uh, just a couple of uh, intro slides before I give you the outline and start talking really fast. Uh, I did a couple of talks, uh, one with the Ozone Show and uh, one with uh, an autism think tank called Thrive, and they asked me to talk about redox signaling. And so people are all talking about redox signaling molecules and ASEA, you know, it's a redox signaling molecule. It's a pro-oxidant. And pro-oxidants, uh, when Dr. Ashner was speaking, he was talking about the harm of reactive oxygen species. And this is what we're always worrying about when we take uh, antioxidants is the quench reactive oxygen species. And it's not like you can read any of these up here, but there's all these different re reactive oxygen species, some of which are always bad, like hydroxyl radical down here. But others aren't necessarily bad because they stimulate your body to turn up its own internal antioxidant system. Unless, of course, there's something blocking that. So uh, reactive oxygen species have their place in the world. Glutathione has its place in the world. Glutathione is your central antioxidant. It's the most important one that you have. There was some uh, talk for years about uh, ascorbate being the thing that sets the redox tone in the cells, but it's really glutathione. It's something that you make. It can't be something that uh, comes seasonally in your diet. And you control the levels of glutathione in your body, and you control the ratio of reduced to oxidized glutathione. And these are very important things for maintaining health. In fact, glutathione isn't just an antioxidant. We use it for detoxification, but it's also a major part of our immune system and setting the immune tone. In fact, the innate immune system gets very weak when the glutathione levels are down. In fact, herpes virus is the most notoriously reactive to glutathione levels. High glutathione levels, herpes viruses, all of them don't grow at all. So it's a very important thing on a number of levels. This was just a slide about glutathione uh, linked to longevity. And in fact, in studies that I've done uh, before with glutathione, you can see people with high glutathione levels look very young for their age. And conversely, 
people with low glutathione levels uh, should come see me after the talk. Uh, pathologies related to glutathione deficits, uh, all oxidative stress conditions, heavy metal toxicity, herpes family and other viral infections, cardiovascular disease, diabetes type 2. Diabetes type 2 usually involves a lot of insulin resistance, which is an oxidative stress condition. In fact, the insulin receptor on the cells is a dithiol meaning that it's sensitive to metals and it's sensitive to oxidative stress and it gets oxidized and then it can't, the insulin can't dock on it and then you have insulin resistance. Uh, cirrhosis and other liver conditions, uh, neurodegenerative conditions like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. Uh, Parkinson's uh, was talked about in relation to mercury. I've got one or two slides on that a little bit later. Cystic fibrosis, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, rheumatoid arthritis. In fact, rheumatoid arthritis and schizophrenia uh, seem a little bit different. Dave, when do you move into lapels? These, these things are kind of funny. All right. Rheumatoid arthritis, there's a localized glutathione deficit in the joints where this autoimmune condition is going on. With schizophrenia, there's a localized glutathione deficit in the brain. It makes you wonder whether uh, schizophrenic episodes come only once you've got a high enough uh, toxic burden in the brain to create you know, a miswiring that's going on there. Uh, I mentioned glutathione and the immune system. Uh, it's a little hard to read that, but it says endocrine disruptors that deplete glutathione levels in antigen-presenting cells promote TH2 TH2 polarization. So when we talk about immunity, we talk about TH1 and TH2. TH1 is more of your innate immunity, your ability to kill uh, intracellular invaders, kill viruses, bacteria, funguses. Whereas TH2 is acquired immunity and is more related to allergy. When you get TH2 polarization, that means you've weakened TH1 and you allow yeasts and molds and viruses to grow, but you've increased TH2 and you become very reactive to things, especially foods. So these people that come in and they're harboring all kinds of chronic infections, but they can't eat anything, that's a TH2 polarization. And glutathione is good at bringing that polarization back into, well, removing that polarization and creating a balance. So what are we going to run through here? We're going to talk about the detoxification, uh, detoxification system. We're going to talk about disruption to the detoxification system. Because really, if everything is cool and we're healthy, we detox well. It's when those disruptions happen and we don't detox, and those are coupled to exposures, that's when we start having problems. Uh, then I'll talk about the core system called the antioxidant detoxification protein repair system. I call it the super system. And that's all the enzymes that you invoke that use things like antioxidants that you make and put them into their respective roles. We'll talk a little bit about synergism and toxicity uh, and how different factors can come together to create an illness scenario. A lot of times, you know, we can get really stuck saying, oh, it's the mercury. It's all the mercury. But a lot of times there's something that happens to the body that makes it less resistant to the mercury. And then a little bit of mercury goes a long way towards disrupting your biochemistry. And so I'll talk about the idea of mercury or metal resistance. Because I want to get you to this idea of understanding detoxification on kind of a microscopic and a macroscopic level, microscopic being the cell and macroscopic being the body. So the cell has to detoxify and push away and get into circulation and then circulation needs to be filtered and gotten out of the body. And it's when that first step of the cellular detoxification falls apart, that's when you start being very susceptible to the mercury load that you have. Your reactions to mercury have nothing to do, well, they obviously have something to do with your load, but it's not just load. There's all these inner factors that are going on that are going to determine how susceptible you are to that. And then we'll talk about CPR for the glutathione system, how we bring it up. So if all goes well, and I talk fast in the beginning, oh, it's already too late, we'll do half of the talk on just how to, just how to help the glutathione system. So this is what I was just talking about, cellular resistance versus the body burden. The body burden doesn't dictate your 
reaction. More of it is dictated at a cellular level. And a lot of these mechanisms are the same that are happening in the cell and on a larger, uh, on, on a larger level. But it's very important that you first think about what the cell needs to push away. Just push away, keep the toxin away from the cellular proteins, away from the target sites of the toxicity, and get them out of the cell. Out of the cell, into the matrix, they'll get to circulation, circulation being blood and lymph, and from there they get filtered. There they get filtered. There's a boy doing some filtering. I was looking for some cool picture, you know, and I'm like, I'm just going through all those Google images and then found a little boy peeing in the shrubs. I figured that's the right one. So you move into circulation from circulation to excretion, and that's the liver GI, fecal excretion, the kidneys, and urinary excretion, but also the skin and the lungs. You're always breathing things out. Certain things you breathe out more than others. And the skin sweating is a, is a, is a great adjunctive for a good detox program. So back to our idea of the cell. And what does the cell need in its biochemistry to be able to push away, push away, push away? And uh, I always go back to this old paper. I'd actually been lecturing on this for a while before I found this paper that summarized the whole thing. And uh, they were using these uh, zebrafish cells, and they were making cell cultures. And they mutate the cells, and they got a lot of, you know, a couple hundred mutations. And they screen them for resistance to things. And they were looking for cadmium resistance. Now, when they found their cadmium resistant cells, they found that they are also resistant to mercury and arsenic. Now, that's a big three to remember. Cadmium, mercury, and arsenic are all detoxified by the glutathione system. Lead is a little bit different, but those three all go by the glutathione system. And so they say, okay, these cells are resistant to these metals. And they make a cell culture, a petri dish, and they have the cells in there. And they put a body burden, a petri dish burden, of five micromolar. It's a lot of metal. And they're able to deal with that. So they take them apart and they say, why can they deal with it? What do they have? What special characteristics do they have? And they find that they make a lot of glutathione. They have high glutathione synthesis rate. Second thing is they make a lot of what's called glutathione as transferase. This is an enzyme responsible for catalyzing, kind of plucking the metal off of the cellular protein and linking it onto the glutathione. So they make a lot of glutathione. They have a lot of transferase, which makes the glutathione metal conjugate. And then they have a lot of transporter. Transporters are called phase three detox, and these ones are called MRPs, multi-drug resistance proteins. And they push out. They use ATP and magnesium, which means you're going to use energy, and you need a lot of magnesium to do this. And they push out of the cell. And when all that's working, they deal with that body burden. But then if they go and they knock out one of those three things and turn them from high rates to lower rates, it could be anyone, the glutathione synthesis, the conjugation activity, or the transport activity, now the cells die. So did we change the body burden in this? We did not. The body burden remains the same. But the cellular resistance mechanisms, when they're cooking, the cells survive. So it's important when you do a detoxification that you're not just focused on trying to rip mercury out of the body, but you're focused on turning up the cell's ability to resist it. And then you're going to be able to turn up the excretion ability to get it out. In fact, those same transport proteins that are at the cells pushing away are in the liver, filtering the blood flow and pushing into the bile and into the stool. They're in the kidneys and the proximal tubules, pulling from the blood, pushing into the urine. So when we turn all this stuff up, not only does your body burden start going down, but your resistance goes up and your ability to accommodate that load goes up. So those three things, remember them. Intracellular glutathione sufficiency, effective glutathione as transfer, transferase activity, that linking activity, and then the phase three clearance, the pushing out. Now, detox is often arranged into phases. Well, not often, it's always arranged into phases, and it's discussed in phases, phases one, two, three. 
Now, I gave you these one, two, three things before, but they don't exactly correlate. Phase two will correlate. Phase three will correlate. The first is just glutathione sufficiency. So, but in the phases, it's called phase one, phase two, phase three. And phase one is called an activation reaction. Phase two is conjugation, that linking together. Phase three is transport out. Now, to go back to those a little bit, phase one is not related to glutathione. Phase one is not even needed for metals, but it's needed for organic toxins, pesticides, herbicides, uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, uh, uh, PCBs. It's needed for hormones like estrogen. In fact, they're finding now with breast cancer, cervical cancer, big relationship to estrogen metabolism. And it's phase one compounds or phase one enzymes creating reactive estrogen compounds that are then supposed to be pushed into glutathione conjugate and taken out of the body. But the phase one reaction products are actually toxic. And if you don't have phase two and phase three, you make a lot of phase one toxic intermediates that are carcinogenic. So phase one is not needed for metals, but it needs to be, needs to be coupled into phase two because it creates essentially free radicals out of toxins. Phase two is that conjugation, linking something with either glutathione or glucuronic acid or a sulfate group, and that makes the toxin uh, hydrophilic or water loving so that it can go into the blood and it makes it recognizable by the transporters. They're looking for those conjugates to push them out. Glutathione as transferase is the one that we use. And of course, they find uh, people with glutathione as transferase deficiencies tend to accumulate more mercury compounds, tend to be more reactive to those compounds. Phase three is that transport out. Uh, here's what I call the MRP, the multi-drug resistance proteins. They have some different numbers. They used to be glutathione ex-conjugate transporters, but they've settled on MRPs. And it's important to see that in phase one, you have a lot of reactions. There's a lot of different enzymes that do that. Phase two, there's a handful of them, the transfer and transferases, but they all feed into one pathway at the end, which is the transporters. And these are all through the body. You, people used to talk about hepatic phases of hepatic detoxification as if it didn't happen in the rest of the body. But these are in all the cells. You just have higher amounts in the liver, intestines, and kidneys because detox is their game. But you have them in the brain. And I'll show you slides later where you have them abundantly located along the blood-brain barrier, meaning you can detoxify your brain. You can be less crazy. It can happen. Come see me. I'll give you some stuff. It's cool. But you have them everywhere. And so here's a schematic. And so if, we're, if I drew a line here, I should draw a big membrane here, and we'll be up in the cell, and you have phase one, phase two reactions. And then that toxin conjugate is pushed through the transporter across the cell membrane into the blood where it can be pulled by another transporter into the liver and then pushed out into the small intestine or over in the kidney. These transporters, these are not related to glomerular filtration. And if you do testing with us, we do a urine to blood ratio. We're looking at ability of your kidneys to push mercury conjugates into the urine from the blood. Those transporters are in the proximal tubules. And so you may have adequate glomerular filtration rates, but still not be able to move mercury into the urinary stream. And if you see that, that means those transporters are broken and those transporters are not just for mercury, they're for a lot of different things. And so you are not able to detoxify then through your kidneys. And there are ways to repair that, but it's pretty, it's something that you want to address. So to look at this at a more naturopathic level, so here's our microcosmic picture and going all the way out is our macrocosmic. So the microcosmic in the cells, you have phase one and two reactions. You push through the matrix, you push through the membrane through the transport protein, and that puts you into the blood? No, you go into the extracellular matrix. 
Now, I'm a big fan of the extracellular matrix. I've got to bring my t-shirts. I always tell you I will. It says, I love the extracellular matrix. And, you know, if you go to Phil and Bob's naturopathic training, you'll learn all about the German biological medicine and the science of the extracellular matrix. But everything has to go from the blood through the matrix to get in and from the cell through the matrix to the blood to get out. And so health of the extracellular matrix is crucial. If we had more time, I'd start rambling about that, but I'm not going to. So then those transporters pull you into the liver and from the liver to the small intestine. Now, of course, the liver's doing a lot of this itself. It's filtering portal circulation, and it's doing these phase one and two reactions in the liver, protecting you from things that you ate and pushing them back into the bile and into the GI tract. You have some of these going right from the blood through the transporters into the GI tract. And then, of course, I told you in the proximal tubules of the kidneys, you have that going on. So how do we disrupt the detoxification system? Here I have the kidney out of the picture, but the GI tract is a big focus for what we do because so much of it comes down to that. And there's good reasons why GI health is like, you know, it's like the, the main thing in functional medicine these days. Well, let's fix the, fix the gut first. Here we have an inflamed small intestine. We'll show you what happens. So usually we have this flow down and out. But when we bring inflammation into the small intestine, it actually blocks that transporter right there. So that transporter turns way down. Then there's a negative feedback inhibition back on the phase two enzymes. And the phase two enzymes stop cranking on uh, with conjugation. And you have this blockage of the whole system where you got a buildup of what was in the blood and a buildup of stuff in the cells. And so phase two and phase three turn down, but phase one doesn't. And this has been a big thing uh, that people have looked at in functional medicine is the, is the mismatch between phase one and phase two. Phase one responds to the toxic load by amping up, but phase two and phase three can only start working again if this transport chain opens back up. So if you go back to that story I told you about the estrogen and phase one enzymes creating estrogen quinones, which are cancer causing, then you're going to have a buildup of cancerous estrogens. You're going to have a buildup of uh, very toxic intermediates when you start detoxifying pesticides and herbicides. So it's very important to harmonize that whole thing. So when you block it at the GI tract, you block all of that. Uh, more stuff that you can't read from back there. In fact, I can't even read it from up here. It's so blurry. But I know what it says, fortunately. And this was, uh, they induced inflammation in rats and they wanted to see how that detoxification altered during a high inflammation event. And so this is inf inflammation turning down. So this is the normal rats and this is the ones injected with IL-6 to, no, they're injected with lipopolysaccharides. That's endotoxin. It's parts of dead bacteria. This is really important because when you have root canals and cavitations, you're getting endotoxin into you. When you have chronic UTIs, you're getting endotoxin into you. When you have a strong infection, you're getting endotoxin in. And endotoxin is synergistically toxic with mercury, cadmium, lead, a bunch of other compounds. In fact, when I said you can knock out the proximal tubule transport, the way that they can reproduce that in mice is by giving you endotoxin and mercury together. Either one alone doesn't do it. So endotoxin they're using here to create inflammation, and this is transcription of genes uh, that are for detoxification. And in all these areas, this is duodenum, duodenum jejunum, ileum, uh, colon. The detox genes all go down through the GI tract when it inflames. And this is what's happening in the liver. And what happens is all these normal pathways that would conjugate things and stick them into the GI tract, they all get turned down. And one thing stays open over here, it's called MRP3, and that's a door back into the blood to go to the kidneys. So the kidneys are going to pick up the slack when the GI, liver GI path is blocked. So the way that would look, normally you're going between these kidney and GI route, then you block the GI, and the liver shunts over to the kidneys, and you have an exaggerated load going through the kidneys. All right, now you could deal with that for a little bit, but remember I said eventually lipopolysaccharides or endotoxin and uh, metals will burn out that mechanism in the kidneys. So now you've burned out both sides and you have this 
higher load circulating through both ends or the higher load circulating in the body and you've blocked your two main paths out. All right. Now flip back to what are the what are the parts of this detoxification system? And uh, I call this the antioxidant detoxification protein repair super system. Let me see if this thing works. Oh, it does work good. And in this, so in the middle of this, you have antioxidants, uh, things we know and love. There's glutathione. This is thyroidoxin, lipoic acid, vitamin C and E, CoQ10. We used to think of those as the main players, but they don't really play. They just exist. The players, they're sort of the nouns in the game and the verbs the things that create action are the enzymes in the periphery here that drive those things into all their respective roles. So, let me see what's next. Okay, so you have enzymes that can make glutathione an antioxidant. You can, it can make it a protein repair molecule or a detoxification molecule. So, I think I'd go through those in, the, in a couple slides future. Uh, glutathione is the main thing that we're talking about here. Glutathione is a sulfhydro group. Uh, when Dr. Oshner talked, he was talking about mercury's affinities for sulfhydro groups. Here we're using a tripeptide. It's got glutamate, glycine, and cysteine as the central component. And that sulfhydro group exchanges uh, its proton for mercury. Uh, so it's important to make an understanding of, of antioxidants. Because I already tipped my hand saying that some of the things we think are antioxidants aren't really antioxidants, but they incite antioxidant activity in us. So we have exogenous antioxidants, things that we take in from outside. We get cysteine in diet, vitamin A, vitamin E, and C in diet. And then endogenous, things that we make inside. We make glutathione, we make superoxide dismutase, CoQ10. And then the machine to drive all that is the enzymatic machinery that makes things happen. So what do we think is stronger, the exogenous antioxidants or the endogenous? Something you make inside is a stronger one. And then when you couple it to the enzymes that really give it the oomph and its action, that's when you really got some power. So what did I not mention is all these plant compounds that we talk about, like oligomeric proanthocyanidins. Those are the compounds in pine bark extract, in grape seed extract, grape skin extract, things that we find in green tea extract. What, what are those? These new superfoods like acai. Those are actually stimulants of the super system. They're stimulants of expression of your formation of glutathione, superoxide dismutase, and all the enzymes that work with uh, then I, all the enzymes that will work with glutathione. So here the antioxidant enzymes, you've got glutathione peroxidase that will take glutathione and use it to quench uh, a hydroxyl radical, a hydrogen peroxide, a lipid peroxide. You've got ascorbate peroxidase. These, you know, the ascorbate doesn't quench those things alone. It needs this enzyme. And when you do that, then you've oxidized the glutathione. You have oxidized glutathione. And oxidized glutathione is actually working against you. So you have to bring it back into its reduced pool using reductases. So you have glutathione reductase, uh, dehydroascorbate reductase, lipomide dehydrogenase. Those are all reductases. You've got glutaredoxin that uses glutathione as a protein repair molecule. You've got a lot of sulfhydro groups in your cells. And those are not just targets for mercury, they're targets for reactive oxygen species. And they can be oxidized and you can use glutathione to repair them through glutaredoxin. Now, as a side note, of all these enzymes that you make, you make one form in the cytoplasm and you'll make a special different form inside the mitochondria. The mitochondria are super places, and Ochner uh, started out our, our lecture series talking about the mitochondria, and that's where you're making all this ATP, but that's where you're burning up all the wood through the fire and trying to have a controlled fire and generate ATP with it. So as such, you have a lot of little expo explosions of reactive oxygen species, so they had to make special enzymes, they, you know, the hand of God made special enzymes for the mitochondria that were more resistant to these reactive oxygen species. But the trade-off was that they're more susceptible to oxidation by mercury, cadmium, and arsenic. So this is why fatigue 
is and mitochondrial dysfunction in various ways is the hallmark of metal toxicity because the metals are going in and they're damaging the mitochondria. Here's a good picture of a working mitochondria where we have the electron transport chain inside a membrane. And if we get there at the end, I'm going to talk about phosphatidylcholine therapy and the importance of membranes. Because here we have a good membrane taking, you know, burning the wood and combining it with oxygen. These electrons are blasting along through there and generating a lot of ATP and a little bit of free radical coming off of that. But in the damaged membranes, in the damaged mitochondria, and they have schematically these little holes in the membranes, these guys need more PC to rebuild their membranes. And now the electron transport chain is leaky. Leaky means that coming off of it are free radicals, damaging molecules and a very small amount of ATP. So now instead of your mitochondria being powerhouses for you, they're creating the oxidative stress that you're suffering from. So the last part of this is the detoxification part, and that involves the, trans the transferases I talked about, like glutathionase transferase, and the transport proteins, the phase three transport proteins, the multidrug resistance proteins. Uh, incidentally, all the literature, good literature around this came from cancer journals, and they referred to this, this chemistry as being your mechanisms for removing the free radical generating offenders the toxins that get into the cells that can create damage to your DNA. And in fact, in the estrogen and cancer story, what they found the estrogen free radicals were doing were abstracting DNA base pairs and causing mutations. And they found women with breast cancer and risk factors, factors for breast cancer were urinating out estrogen DNA addicts. And so the way to stop that is to block those, to harmonize phase one into phase two and block some of those reactions or, or stop it from having that free radical intermediate. So how does the system break down? So you can have a glutathione deficiency and that could be a genetic or an epigenetic uh, deficiency or environmental. Now, environmental is often uh, an epigenetic thing. An environmental toxin will will mess up your genes in some ways, but it can also just be runaway consumption. You have so much mercury going through your system and so many other toxins, you're just using up all your glutathione. Glutathione has transferase, the same thing, genetic and epigenetic. And phase three, remember I said everything funnels down to phase three, so if we block phase three, we're blocking everything upstream for it. And the biggest way to block phase three is through that inflammation. In fact, inflammation turns all of this down. So chronic inflammation is creating chronic toxin retention. Once you get into this big inflammatory cycle, it's very hard to stop. It's very hard to detoxify. It's one of the reasons there's been in our world, there's been uh, a debate over the years as to whether to go after, do antimicrobial therapy first and kill infections. You know, someone with Lyme and, and metal toxicity, what do you do first, kill the Lyme or go after the metals? Some people used to say go after the metals, but I'd say no, you're never going to win. You have to kill some of the infective organisms and bring the inflammation down, and then your detox will be easy. Uh, let's just skip that. All right. Uh, one of the ways that your system decays with time is time. Uh, age brings a lowering of the expression of your detox system. And so these were rats, young and old rats, and what they found is as the rats aged, uh, there was anywhere from a 20 to a 37% decay in the antioxidants, and anywhere from a uh, 20 to 50% drop in the antioxidant enzymes. So age was, you know, and age is correlated with inflammation, but age was just slowing down this whole detox process. The robustness of this system, the system that's creating what I called before the resistance to the metals, the resistance to the toxins, it was going down with time. So at the end, fortunately, we'll see how they save the rats. Uh, and just for your brain, so you can know how the brain, the brain pain works, uh, these are neurons, and you have middle-aged and old neurons here, and this is the redox potential. And so you want a nice, highly reduced neuron, and with age, it's getting more oxidized. Uh, you flip that around, this one, the higher up, the more reduced it is. 
And these were embryonic, middle-aged, and old uh, rat neurons. And you see this decay over time in the antioxidant integrity of the neurons. Now, this is important. When they put glutamate into the neuron culture, they killed these neurons at a much faster rate. So why is glutamate important to us? The glutamate receptor is the primary target of neurotoxicity of mercury. So mercury is going in, it's hyperstimulating the glutamate receptor, which is you're basically you're making more glutamate and reacting more to the glutamate. And glutamate is your sympathetic autonomic uh, neurotransmitter. It gets you alert, vigilant, freaked out, and paranoid, and full of anxiety. Well, the first two were temporary things, long term, where the freaked out, paranoid, full of anxiety. So that is the most common neurological symptom of mercury is anxiety. And that's because of the hyperstimulation of the glutamate sy uh, system. And that also causes neuroinflammation. It, the whole brain gets all wired up like that. It has to calm down. You need more GABA activity to settle down before you can detoxify. So the glutamate is helping burn up your neurons. So once you get into that high anxiety state, it's exaggerating or speeding up uh, the kind of damage that you get. So just a little bit about toxicity and symptomology. Uh, uh, yesterday, uh, there was talks about epigenetics. And one of the things I'd like to see talked about with epigenetics is in utero exposure and what it does to the glutathione system. This was a study on fish that were highly exposed to mercury. And when they were born, as little fishlets, they were born with a lowered glutathione system. They had low glutathione peroxidase, glutathione transferase, glutathione reductase. They didn't have obvious mercury damage, but they had a higher susceptibility to the next insults that will come their way. So you're born with a weak defense system. Then when the next insult comes in, it's going to get you more, uh, more easily than before. They did this also in mice. And in utero, exposure causes a dose-dependent inhibition of development of the glutathione system. So they only exposed them in utero, and then they stopped. 12, we 12 weeks later, there was no difference in the body levels of mercury between the previously exposed and the unexposed mice. But their glutathione system in the previously exposed mice was significantly impaired. So they would be more susceptible to the next round of, of insults. And in fact, there's other data showing transgenerational effects where second generations are much more susceptible to a toxin like mercury than the first generation were. Uh, and when I was in uh, Vancouver, I talked about this idea of isomercuric syndrome, uh, iso being like mercury. A lot of people coming to me and saying, oh, my God, I know I'm mercury toxic. I have all the neurological symptoms. And incidentally, the neurological symptoms mimic a lot of other neurotoxins. And I'd interview them as to whether they had any mercury exposure. And they really didn't accept they, you know, their mother was a dentist and they grew up in the dental place or their mother had a whole bunch of amalgams or they had some sort of in utero exposure. And then after they were born, even though they didn't get mercury, they got a number of other neurotoxins that normally would be detoxified like mer mercury. It might have been cadmium and, and arsenic. It might have been mold toxins. Mold toxins go right into there. But they got those neurotoxic symptoms because of their susceptibility that was generated through uh, in utero exposures. And, uh, and I mentioned like a, a, something like a mercury miasma is what a homeopath would talk about. Uh, last part about immunity, uh, I'd mentioned this about Th2 polarization. And just to show you, uh, these are the uh, cytokines. This is a different experiment where they used ethanol to deplete the glutathione levels in rats. And what happened after this drinking binge is their interferon went to zero, glutathione goes down, interferon goes down, and you know, viruses take over. And their IL-4, which would make you more food intolerant, goes way up. So that's you know the weekend of college binging and you got the flu and diarrhea. That was a glutathione-dependent thing. 
Thank God I have a glutathione company. <laughs> See me later. We're covered. It's all cool. The only problem I have is this, this microphone here. This is, I probably have it on backward. In fact, maybe that's the key. See, Dave makes me wear this thing, but he doesn't put it on. Oh, yeah, it hooks over the top. How about that? Brilliant. Takes a PhD, you know. Good Lord. All right, uh, so let's look at how this plays out. You've got toxicity. You've got immune dysregulation. Raised TH2, lower TH1. Raised TH2 gives you food sensitivities and allergies. Lower TH1 gives you chronic infection. Both of them yield chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation further depresses uh, detoxification. When that gets worse, you start getting vascular permeability or leaking proteins out into the periphery. You've got blood-brain barrier penetration. You're getting things in there. And then you're leading to all kinds of things. That no, oh, no, that's nitric oxide, peroxynitrate, glutamate, uh, hypersensitivity, creating that brain fog and irritability, uh, neuroexcite. Uh, excitotoxicity, you've got all kinds of things that come once you go down that ladder of effect. And it doesn't mean that mercury was even part of it, but it'll certainly look like it was. And if mercury is there, it's definitely going to play into that. So now let's get into how we fix this super system. And we want to upregulate all of that. Remember, we need effective clearance, the phase three, we need the transferases, and we need adequate glutathione level. So if we're going to talk first about uh, phase three, that means usually it's treated with intestinal binders. We need to move toxins out of the GI tract because they create these little inflammatory uh, situations that block detoxification. And they also, when those transport proteins are trying to move down into the GI tract and you're not taking the metal away or the toxin away, the transporters slow down. They can't push against that gradient. So you need stuff to go in, bind, and take it out. So there's things like uh, thiol resins, uh, chlorella, clay, zeolite, pectins, alginates. Uh, and I'll, I'll go back and talk a little bit about those binding agents. Phytonutrients, polyphenols, sulfur-based foods uh, for upregulating phase two. And then I'll talk about how, uh, how ozone works into that as well. And then glutathione supplements, uh, liposomal glutathione, acetyl glutathione, precursors, or again, upregulating that system will help you make more glutathione. Uh, in those binders that I talked about, thiol resins, these are particles saturated with, with sulfhydro groups. That's the most specific for heavy metals. Chlorella is kind of multi-mode. They, uh, they do have metal binding sites, but not a lot, so you've got to take a lot of it. But they have uh, some other things like anion exchange that's good for biofilms as well, or biotoxins. So chlorella can do metals and biotoxins. Activated charcoals get mostly, they get a little bit of everything, but especially big molecules, uh, big things like uh, for volatile organic carbons like you get from car exhausts uh, or, or from solvents, uh, pesticides, herbicides, and very importantly, mold toxins and endotoxin. Charcoal is good to blend with every other binder. I like to take charcoal with the thiol resins it's because it's getting those endotoxins from the GI tract and it's getting mold toxins as well. Clays and zeolites are really good too. Uh, of the eight major mold toxins, one of them, aflatoxin, binds really well to clays. The other seven out of the eight bind well to charcoals. Uh, there is one other one to mention called chitosan. A lot of people, if they're into biotoxin remediation, they'll use cholestyramine. Cholestyramine is an anion exchange re resin uh, that's a prescription. And then there's a lighter duty one called Welchol. Uh, but chitosan is exactly the same kind of structure as the Welchol. And so it's got a uh, biotoxin binding capability. Uh, the reason that they uh, use it for losing weight is that it binds bi it bile salts as well so that you don't absorb your fats, you don't emulsify them and absorb them. But in doing that, it's binding toxins in the bile salts as well. All right, so now talking about phase two upregulation, uh, we're going to talk about phytogenomics. Phyto is plants. 
regulating gene expression. And here, different plant chemicals can churn up all of our uh, chemoprotective genes. And the main ones that we look at are polyphenols and sulfur compounds. But now we found that the oxidants do that as well. We'll cover, cover that a little bit later. Uh, Mike Ashner talked about NRF2. And if we're in a cell here, and this is the nucleus, there's this, pro this protein pair out in, outside the nucleus called the KEEP1 and the NRF2. And enzyme inducers, like these plant compounds, come and tag this and change its conformation, and the NRF2 goes into the nucleus. And when it does that, all the genes that have a certain promoter region, a promoter region is sort of how you recognize the function of a gene, and this promoter region is called the antioxidant response element, and it turns up all these antioxidants and detoxification elements. And that leads to detoxification and cell survival. So this is obviously something good that we want to do because it brings up the expression of our whole super system here. So what does it? Well, uh, epicatechins do it. Uh, polyphenols like elagic acid uh, do it. Uh, here's the hand of the medicine Buddha. I usually flash a picture of the medicine Buddha. Everybody's like, what the hell are you putting the medicine Buddha up for? And I put him up because he's holding a plant called the Myrobalan. It's often called Harataki. Its uh, scientific name is Terminalia chebula. And it has all the best polyphenols in it. It's very, very rich in different polyphenols. And that rat study that I showed you where the young and the old rats and the old rats had lost their antioxidant capability, when they fed them aqueous extracts of the Harataki, the levels of the, of the old rats went back up to the levels of the young rats. Well, that's great for all us old rats out here, right? I know, there's a lot of rats. What do you think the young ones did? Did the young ones go up 30% too? No. A lot of you have heard this one before. Now, the young rats are good. You know, young rats are always good, and there was nowhere to go because everything was being expressed already. It's with age that it declines, but then you can bump that level up, and I'll show you a similar experiment with arlipoic acid later. So sulfur compounds can do this as well, but they're a bit more prone to intolerance. Uh, our lipoate is the one that we use the most. So here's ones that you would recognize. Uh, sulforaphane, arucin, allyl isothiocyanate, those all come from crucifers. Allicin from garlic, allyl isothiocyanate is the English superfood. Did anybody ever think there could be an English superfood? Of course not. They were very excited in England when I told them this, and they gave me a jar of English hot mustard to go home. Because horseradish has allyl isothiocyanate. Or wasabi, that stuff, you eat it and it burns your nose. You're like, how the hell did it burn my nose when it's in my mouth? Well, that's the beauty of allyl isothiocyanate, and uh, my kids try to see if they can say that. It's like a, it's a competition at home. Uh, all these, and allicin from garlic, are very strong at upregulating, but there's a lot of intolerance of this. In fact, uh, mercury toxic people have a hard time dealing with all these. Now, part of that is that the sulfur, certain people have high CBS activity, cysta beta thionine synthase, and they're spinning away these sulfur compounds towards sulfate so they can pee them out, but they're getting, bound, they're getting pooled up as sulfite, and they're getting sulfite toxicity. I get this. I need to take a lot of molybdenum. Molybdenum spins up the sulfide oxidase, and then you make more sulfate, and then you don't have that sulfite toxicity. And so 500 micrograms a day if they're having a hard time tolerating this. Uh, if it gets bad for me, I'll do 2,000 a day for a week, and that'll get me back on track. Uh, but for some people, it's not that. You give them the molybdenum, and it's still hard. Uh, you get these people who can't take lipoic acid at all, who can't tolerate those foods at all. The chronic disease groups who are really sick, they have this problem. They can't take this stuff. And see, again, we thought these were antioxidants. They're cytotoxic prooxidants, but they're good, and they're mild, and they can get these things like the NRF2 to express, and then you turn up your detox system. So that's called hormesis. It's a light insult that you respond to. But certain people, it doesn't work very well. Their response is wrong. I'll tell you later why their response is wrong. So lipoic acid is the one that we use the most. Our lipoic acid is the active form, not S-lipoic. Our lipoic is the one that upregulates uh, NRF2. It's used for type 2 diabetes as a prescription in Germany, used for heavy metal toxicity, 
Cutler will tell you that it's a direct chelator. I will tell you it's not. I'll show you 80 papers on NRF, uh, NRF2 upregulation, glutathione upreg upregulation with lipoic acid, and he'll tell you that there's a Russian paper that none of you can read that, uh, that says that this is how it works. Uh, but it's from upregulation that it works. Age-related decline in the antioxidant system. Young rats, old rats, same deal. Mitochondrial dysfunction. The reason we use arlipoic acid the most is because it's a twofer. Arlipoic acid is also a stimulant of mitochondrial biogenesis, and it helps mitochondrial function. So if I can turn up the glutathione system and build the, glut and build the mitochondria at the same time, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, and they said here, decline in transcriptional activity of NRF2 causes age-related loss of glutathione synthesis. It's how often you turn that big master switch on. You do it with a certain frequency just to maintain things, and then you do it in response to stress to save yourself from something. But over time, that frequency of use of it goes down, and the lipoic acid reverses that. So young rat, old rat, you can get the harataki or the lipoic acid or both. Uh, here, this is about the twofer because it's increasing mitochondrial function, decreasing oxidative damage, and increasing metabolic rate. So it does both of those for us. Ozone, now, mechanisms of action uh, involved in ozone therapy is healing induced via a mild oxidative stress. This, sorry, Frank Schallenberger, wherever you are, I didn't come to your lecture because I was obsessing on my slides. But this had to be what he was talking about. It Was this what he was talking about? Giving you ozone before things because it turns on a lot of your defense mechanisms. And this is in that ozone pro paper, and they're talking about the KEEP1 NRF2, and they're talking about the right kind of free radicals to hormetically induce NRF2 activity. And this is more of the same from another paper, and it's ozonides turning up NRF2 expression. So we go back to this picture of the KEEP1 NRF2 turning on all these good genes, and we thought it was only phytochemicals, but now we realize it's phytochemicals and they're radicals. We realize it's reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species, reactive sulfur species. In fact, in the ozone world, they were doing, they were mixing ozone and glutathione together, and any, any chemist is going, oh, Jesus, what are you doing? You know, you're destroying the glutathione. Well, the destroyed glutathione is a hormetic signal for you to turn up your reductases and clean up, this, clean up the mess. And they're like, well, it worked. And I'm like, well, you got lucky. <laughs> you know, all right, it worked in the end, but it was a bad idea in the beginning. And so this is just from that paper. And these are different destroyed glutathione species. And the more wrecked it is, the more of a hormetic enzyme inducer it is. Uh, this is the dopamine, uh, some of the dopamine Parkinson's work. This is the NRF2. They, when they had these little worms that would get Parkinson's from uh, methylmercury exposure, if they turned up NRF2, they didn't get Parkinson's. If they knocked out NRF2, they did get Parkinson's. So it's gene environment interactions. The toxin only gets you if you don't have your defenses working. Uh, and then this is at the blood-brain barrier. These are uh, capillaries at the blood-brain barrier. Stained in red is the transferase, glutathione S transferase, phase two. Stained in green is MRP, phase three. And in yellow, they're co-located, meaning the, all the capillaries of the blood-brain barrier have a detox and efflux pump to push stuff out of there. And if we know how to upregulate it, then we're in good shape. So we know what upregulate it. Lates it, but now we need a couple of guide and a little bit of guidance on how to do that. How much do we take? How often do we take it? And so, NRF2 upregulation rules this was using St. John's wort, which upregulates this detox very heavily. And uh, these are dosages here. And so, no dose, low dose, medium dose do nothing. You go to a good Chinese medical practitioner, he's going to give you a bag of herbs and you're going to cook down like, you know, a bowl full of herbs into a cup and drink it twice a day. And you're going to make a new bowl every day. And in about five days, it's like you're a new man. You had to go to high doses to do that. And so at the high doses, now you have a two to three fold increase in the expression of these enzymes. So at that highest dose, now what about time? Can we do that every day? 
If I turn the machinery up two to three fold over baseline, can I keep it there for four years? No. So here we have time. So at the highest dose, over 10 days, you go from baseline up to three fold over baseline. So boop, 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 boop. Now you're really cranking here, and you keep taking it for another 20 days, and it goes bup, 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 bup. You habituate to that input, and it no longer induces that hormetic response. This says you must pulse these supplements. The best, I think, and it shows here too, is 10 days on, 4 days off. When I was at the Thrive Summit, I mentioned that. Everybody had the story about their mentor telling them 10 on, 4 off was the way to go. It's a great cycle. In the beginning, we start five days on, two days off, because we don't want to induce too much. We want to, you know, just ease them into it. And then we get on to two, 10 on, four off. But then that's a, a big question. So if our own oxidative stress can turn this on, what if we're chronically in that oxidative stress? Does that then, do we habituate to that and stop being able to react to that? And I think that's what happens. So... Let's skip that. So what if the mechanisms aren't working? What if NRF2 doesn't even work? Well, why wouldn't NRF2 work? Well, let's see. A re review of the evidence that okra toxin, a major mold toxin, mycotoxin, is an NRF2 inhibitor. Reduction of antioxidant defenses may contribute to okra toxin toxicity and carcinogenicity. So mold toxins actually blocking NRF2 activity. Would this be why so many people are mold toxic or mercury toxic too? Because once that mold turns off your innate defense, the mercury gets into the cells. NRF2 increases survival and attenuates al alveolar growth in, oh, this is hyperoxia. If NRF2 is blocked, you can't give people oxygen therapy. It starts being toxic for them. So look at mold toxins, mold toxin exposure. See if these people are sensitive to ozone. They don't do well with ozone. You, the ones who are sensitive to lipoic acid or crucifers, you need to unblock the NRF2 before you can go further. And the one thing that we found that's the most exciting thing for doing this is methane, DIM. Everybody thought about it for estrogens and stopping bad estrogens, and so it was a woman's supplement. But we started, we found evidence for it reversing epigenetic modification of NRF2. And in this particular paper, it was in prostate cancer. Pin lesions, early prostate cancer lesions have this epigenetic block on NRF2 which is probably why they accumulate so many toxins. That's part of the neoplasticity. So we've used DIM to take these hypersensitive people and make them more tolerant of these supplements. And it's these supplements are the ones, if they do bad with that, that means that those supplements that are actually generating free radicals aren't getting that hormetic response back. They're just generating free radicals. So the supplement is a toxin for them. If that's the case, you start with the DIM. So last part, glutathione supplementation. Uh, in a lot of these things, you've got so much chronic oxidative stress that it's hard to upregulate the glutathione system and fix things it's, you know, by your own glutathione production, and you have to bring some glutathione in. And if you're not able to make it, you're either going to do IV, which is short and doesn't have good cellular penetration. You're going to nebulize, which is very good in lung situations. Transdermal is fairly good, but you get a lot of oxidation because uh, you have so much skin exposure. Uh, acetyl glutathione is another one with higher absorption because regular pills of glutathione don't get absorbed in the GI tract. They get broken down into amino acids. And then my favorite, I'm a liposome guy. And liposomal uh, delivery of glutathione, if you can get a small liposome that does uh, intraoral absorption, that's the best way to go. And one of the reasons I love uh, liposomes is because they're encapsulated in phospholipids. This is what your membranes are made out of. Here are phospholipids, and when we put them in water, they assemble into these things that look like cells. And that's the same thing that your cell membranes are made out of. And if we make them small enough, you can have direct intraoral 
intraoral absorption of things that you normally wouldn't absorb, like EDTA or glutathione, or have enhanced absorption of other compounds. This is, but then the thing that Tom Levy talked about is that you get better cellular penetration when you get a liposome into circulation. If you can get it into circulation, they fuse with the cell membranes and are able to bring that payload right towards the cell. This was, uh, they took uh, nerve cultures and depleted their glutathione, and then they saw how much glutathione they needed to do, to give it to bring the glutathione levels up to save the cell. And they gave the glutathione either as plain aqueous glutathione, like an IV, or as liposomal. And they had a hundred times higher efficiency at raising the cellular levels using liposomes in this cell culture. Uh, other studies that they did with liposomes, uh, this was, you'll never be able to understand this by seeing it from out there, but they were taking uh, immune cells and exposing them to, from HIV patients that had low glutathione levels and they were exposing them to tuberculosis. And it would kill the cells unless they got the glutathione levels up. Then the immune cells could resist the tuberculosis. And they tried NAC and liposomal glutathione. They needed over a thousand times more n cysteine to get that cellular level up than they did with the glutathione. So liposomal glutathione in a stress system is a great way to, uh, to bring that in. Now the liposome, remember I said it brings in phosphatidylcholine. So phosphatidylcholine therapy is a big thing for building membranes, and it's really big in German biological medicine where they do injections of phosphatidylcholine. And uh, we like to do, you know, you're getting phosphatidylcholine with your liposomes, but there's also, we make phosphatidylcholine micelles that are very fast absorption. Now, how important are membranes? So here's a cellular membrane. Here's the cell picture I showed at the beginning. There's a cellular membrane. And we think about the cellular membrane. All right, so here's all the transporters that bring everything in, put everything out. There's all these uh, proteins out here that communicate with the extracellular matrix. You know, there's this whole thing in Bruce Lipton's uh, the cosmology of the cell that the membrane and its ability to communicate with the environment around it is what decides what genes get transcribed. It's not the nucleus, it's happening in the membrane. So you need a good healthy fluid membrane for all this to work well. Is that the end of the membrane story? No, that's only the start of it. Let's get into the cell. What's all this stuff? These are big folded up membranes. This big one here in purple is the endoplasmic reticulum. And it's a big folded up membrane. And it, the, what the membranes do, and when we were talking with Ashner about uh, the mitochondria, they set up a charge potential. They have a different charge on one side than they have on the other, and that charge potential drives these little cellular machines. So what kind of machines do they have all around here? Well, for one, all the enzymes that take your hormones from, well, that go from cholesterol all the way down into uh, testosterone and estrogen, all your sex hormone transformations happen in the membranes of the endoplasmic reticulum, or the first two happen in the membranes of the mitochondria. This other one here is the Golgi apparatus, or the Golgi body. What does the Golgi body do? It makes the extracellular matrix. All those reactions are dependent on having enough, uh, having a fluid membrane and having enough phospholipids. Remember the mitochondria story? All those reactions happen in the membrane of the mitochondria. So if you can rebuild your membranes, you're going to be in great shape. And then there's the endoplasmic reticulum. This is the steroidogenesis chart. Everything in purple happens in the mitochondrial membrane. Everything in green happens in the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. And then there's the Golgi apparatus, which is making your extracellular matrix. Just in case you think the matrix isn't big, this is an experiment where they took a rat heart, took all the cells off of it till it was just matrix. There's no difference in morphology. It's more matrix and cells. And then they seeded them back on with stem cells and it beat it again. So remember, matrix is a massive thing. I'm going to cut there and not hold us up any farther. So thank you all very much. We'll talk more at the break. <laughs>